Throughout much of this video, we've been interacting with the MySQL server using the native command line client. Some of you might find this a tad strange, having perhaps heard of the many available graphical clients at your disposal, such as PHP MyAdmin or MySQL Workbench. I did this on purpose because I think particularly in the early learning stages, it is important to really think about what it is you are doing when constructing MySQL schemas. And in my opinion, the best way to do that is by typing everything in, no matter how tedious that might be. But the reality is, at some point, you are going to want to start using a graphical client. I happen to use several, in fact, in conjunction with the command line client. These clients have a great number of useful features not available using the command line client, such as the ability to save, edit, and repeatedly execute queries, something we'll be doing with quite a bit of regularity in the coming sections. Of course, you can also take advantage of the point and click interface to quickly build and manage database schemas, not to mention carry out various other administrative tasks without having to remember the occasionally awkward MySQL syntax. While a great number of these clients exist, both commercial and open source, there are three in particular which I've used for a number of years now and find them to be particularly beneficial, two of which are open source and the third is commercial. So what I thought we would do is basically take a look at each and go over some of the most interesting features which I use on a regular basis. Hopefully this will give you a pretty solid overview of what's out there allowing you to go ahead in your spare time and choose one of these solutions and use it sometime in the future. There are three graphical MySQL clients that I'd like to introduce you to. Starting with one fantastic open source tool called PHP MyAdmin. PHP MyAdmin is in fact one of the perhaps best known open source projects in the world having first been released somewhere around 1998 and having been continuously and quite actively developed over the course of the following 13 or so years. It is almost a certainty if you have rented shared hosting space from one of the web hosting providers that PHP MyAdmin is already installed and ready for you to begin using to manage your MySQL database, making it a particularly good idea, I think, to install it locally and get familiar with it since it's almost certainly going to be a tool also available at one of these shared hosting providers. It is a web-based tool, meaning that it can easily be installed on really any laptop or server currently running a web server, PHP, and MySQL. Also, because it's open source, it is freely available, meaning you can download it and update it at your leisure without paying any particular licensing fees or anything like that. The second tool I'd like to introduce you to is called MySQL Workbench. MySQL Workbench is also an open source tool. However, this one is desktop based and it is supported on all of the usual operating systems, including Windows, Linux, and OS X. MySQL Workbench is actually developed and maintained by the MySQL development team themselves. And it's been under development for a number of years now. It's certainly a high quality tool. And I think once we work through the introduction, you'll agree with that assessment. And finally, the third tool I'd like to introduce you to is called SQL YOG. Now, unlike the previous two tools, SQL YOG is a commercial tool. At the time that I recorded this video, there were three different versions of SQL YOG, ranging in price between $99 and $179, depending on the version. This is well worth a look, even though there are a number of freely available tools out there, just simply because it is such a high quality administration tool. I happened to use this last year on a particularly large and intense MySQL related project and have little doubt that its unique set of capabilities certainly helped us succeed with flying colors on that particular project. I certainly highly recommend it, and we'll take a quick look at that later in this section.
Okay, the first of the graphical clients that I'd like to introduce you to is PHP MyAdmin. Now, as I mentioned, PHP MyAdmin is a web based tool, and as you can see here, I'm accessing it from my local computer. I have simply placed the downloadable contents of the zip file into a directory on my local web server named PHP MyAdmin, allowing me to easily access the PHP MyAdmin console via my browser. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you do need to have a few things installed on your local computer in order to take advantage of PHP MyAdmin, notably a web server, probably Apache and PHP, and also MySQL, of course. So once you have those installed and configured, you can go ahead and download the PHP MyAdmin software from phpmyadmin.net. It comes with installation instructions, so I'm not going to take the time to guide you through that. It's actually a rather easy process, and I'm quite certain you'll easily be able to work through that simply by reading the install document. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and log in to the interface using my SQL root account. And although I, of course, earlier in the video suggested you typically do not interact with MySQL using your root account, I'm going to go ahead and do that because in doing so, you're going to be able to see a couple different features that aren't otherwise available to non-root users via PHP MyAdmin. I'll press go, which takes me to the main interface. On the left, you'll see a number of different databases that currently reside on this computer. A few other databases which I have not gotten into yet but will introduce you to later in the video. The Sakila database which we briefly looked at in the previous section and will certainly interact with quite a bit more in the sections to come. A test database and another database that I'll talk about later in the video. So what you can do is click on any of these databases to interact with them. So I'll click on the Sakila database. And in doing so, I am taken to a list of all of the tables which are found within that database. So the actor table, which we looked at earlier, the film table, and so on. Now what you can do is you can browse one of these tables. You can take a look at the structure, search the table insert a new row, and so on and so forth. You can delete the table, you can empty its contents, and do all sorts of useful things. So what I'll do is just maybe take a random walk around a number of these features, and let's go ahead and examine the actor table. As you can see, the actor table includes four columns. The actor ID is a small int. It's unsigned. We've gone over all of these attributes in earlier sections. Well, what's nice about PHP MyAdmin, I think, is it offers a very obviously user-friendly interface to be able to examine these sorts of characteristics. What you can do is you can click the checkbox next to one of the columns and click Change, which will allow you to actually modify the column, changing the column name, changing its data type, and so on and so forth. We could bump the Veracare up to 255 if we'd like. So a pretty user-friendly interface. Just go ahead and click the Browse menu item, which takes me to a list of all rows found in that particular table. And again, it's a very friendly point-and-click interface. If we wanted to modify Penelope Guinness's row, maybe we forgot an N at some earlier point. We had misspelled her last name. You can go ahead and do that and press Go to perform that update receive a status message and in fact the last name has been updated. So it's a very user-friendly, very easy interface. You can copy rows, you can delete rows, all highly mouse oriented and really quite easy to use. We can return to the home page for that database if you will by clicking on the database name located at the top. One feature which I really like is the search feature. This is a wildcard search feature and I've been using this almost by the hour at a current client project. What you can do with it is search for certain values in wildcard fashion. So if I want to search all tables for the value Penelope, I can do that. So if I want to look for the exact phrase, for instance, I can select all tables, or I can selectively choose which tables I want to search. So what I'll do is I'll select all and press go. And what that will do is 
return a list of all tables telling you how many matches are found and giving you an opportunity to browse or even delete those rows. So we have a total of eight matches, four of which are found in actor, four of which are found in actor info. So I'll go ahead and browse those entries in order to view the contents of the actor table. And what you'll do is just scroll on down and you'll see the four rows. So it's a very useful way to quickly search, particularly a large database, and you don't happen to recall where a particular value or set of values is found. So if we scroll on up and click on actor info, scroll down again, and you'll see that we're now looking at actor info, and we see that there are again four values just coincidentally associated with Penelope in the actor info table. So very useful way to quickly search a database. You can also construct a query either using a point and click interface, such as the one shown here, or you can go ahead and type out your own query. I'll keep this simple, select all from actor. After clicking the button, you can see that we've returned all values found in the actor table. We're showing rows one through 29 out of 200 total. You can skip ahead to a particular page number. You can scroll back and forth between the various page numbers. So again, a very nice point and click approach to navigating tables contents. There are a couple other really great features that I use on a regular basis with phpMyAdmin. If I return to the phpMyAdmin homepage, you'll see the export and import buttons. It's a rather commonplace task to want to export a particular database. You can export one or several databases using a wide variety of formats. CSV, SQL is another common one. SQL will actually output all of the SQL statements used to recreate the table structure and table contents. CSV is another commonplace format. CSV for Microsoft Excel and there are a number of other different interesting formats here. So what I'll do just to give you a quick demo here is I'll choose the quick export method. Think of it as a wizard, an export wizard. It's just going to kind of assume that you're going to want to use a certain number of options rather than bother you with confirming those options. So I'll go ahead and press go. And what this is doing in this particular case is this is exporting all databases found in this database server. Pretty useful when you want to export all of them. You'll quite often want to export one in particular, and you can do that by clicking on the database name, going to export, and again, following the same process. So let's just do the export wizard, if you will. We want SQL format. I'll press go. As you can see, the name of the file now matches the name of the actual database. So I'll go ahead and save that file. We'll just throw it on the desktop here. That will download to your desktop in this case, at which point you can import it into another database server, maybe residing elsewhere. And if you have phpMyAdmin running on that server, you can use the import tool to import that database. So we're going to import a database that is stored in SQL format, if you will. Again, contains all of the SQL statements used to create that table and all data found within it, if any. And you can just browse for that SQL file. Check out a couple of the other interesting options at your disposal and go ahead and press go, at which point phpMyAdmin will import that database into your database server. So extremely useful. Again, you don't have to think too hard about how to do this. phpMyAdmin does all of the hard work for you. A couple other interesting features before we move on to MySQL Workbench that I'd like to point out. In addition to being able to view and manage your table schemas, in addition to being able to query, insert, copy, delete values or rows from your tables, you can create a new database directly within phpMyAdmin, which is, of course, very nice. You can manage privileges within phpMyAdmin, so you can add a new user without having to remember the grant syntax. You can remove a user or user privileges. So it's very easy to use point and click interface. You'll see you can manage global privileges and do all the same sort of things that you can do with the grant command. So very, very useful stuff. 
So hopefully this quick overview gave you at least some insight into why PHP MyAdmin is such an incredibly popular solution out there for managing your MySQL databases. So next up, let's take a look at MySQL Workbench. The second of the three graphical clients I'd like to introduce you to is MySQL Workbench. As mentioned in the section introduction, MySQL Workbench is a desktop application available for all major platforms, including Windows, Mac OS X, and Linux. I certainly recommend checking out all three of the applications introduced in this section. I'll be using MySQL Workbench throughout much of the remainder of this video, primarily because it is bundled with the MySQL distribution we installed earlier in the video. Furthermore, it is a freely available application meaning you're not going to have to shell out any additional money in order to become familiar with it. So we're actually going to spend more time with MySQL Workbench than the other two discussed in this section. But again, definitely check all three out because I think they're well worth your time. So I'll go ahead and start MySQL Workbench, navigating to the MySQL found in my Windows Start menu. And I'll fire up MySQL Workbench by clicking on the menu icon. Once started, you'll see that there's a rather dizzying array of features at your disposal, all of which are, however, well organized within three workspaces. You have the SQL development workspace. You'll use this area to query and edit your databases and associated data. Next up is the data modeling workspace which you'll use to create, interrelate, and synchronize table schemas in a highly visual way. And I think you'll really like this particular feature. And finally, you have the server administration workspace, which is useful for configuring MySQL, managing user accounts, and reviewing server logs, among other things. So let's take a look at each of these workspaces in detail. You'll use the SQL development workspace to query and otherwise manage your table data and schemas. Before you can start using it, you're going to want to create a new connection. I've clicked on the new connection icon. The first thing you'll want to do is give your new connection a name, which I'll just call localhost since we're going to talk to the local database server. Hostname 127.0.0.1 which is the IP address for localhost. I'll just log in as root for the purposes of this tutorial. Next, you'll want to provide your password. And I'm just going to store it in what they refer to as the vault, which means I'm not going to have to constantly provide my password every time I want to use this connection. So I pressed OK. You can test the connection if you'd like. And indeed, MySQL Workbench tells us that it is able to connect. So I'll press OK. I'll press OK again, and this new connection is saved into MySQL Workbench. The next thing you'll want to do is go ahead and just double click on your new connection. And what that will do is open up the SQL editor as indicated by the tab, which appears at the top of MySQL Workbench. This is a pretty nice interface feature, I think, because you can open multiple tabs and kind of jump back and forth to the Workbench homepage as necessary. So back to the SQL Editor tab. And as you'll see below, there are a number of databases that you can manage or otherwise interact with at this point. So I'll go ahead and click on the Sakila database, which pulls up a list of the by now increasingly familiar set of tables. From here, you can perform a wide variety of tasks, including perhaps most notably querying a table. So for instance, let's go ahead and query the actor table, which is probably by now becoming a familiar theme for you. So I'll go ahead and right click on the actor table and you'll see this select rows limit 1000 option. And I'll go ahead and select that rather quickly. As you can see, we are presented with a list of all rows in the actor table. Very easy way to quickly query a particular table. Interestingly, and this is a huge advantage over using the MySQL command line client, for instance, suppose you were executing a particular query on a regular basis, maybe not repeatedly, but once every 30 minutes. I can promise you 
as you begin doing work with MySQL, this sort of feature will become highly desirable. Suppose you're executing a query on a regular basis and would very much prefer to forego having to perform the series of steps that we just did to pull up this data. What you can do is you can save particular queries as snippets. You can click on the star icon and enter a name for this particular snippet, which this is a pretty easy query. Select everything from the actor table. So we'll just call it select all actors. I'll press OK and I'll close this results tab. And you'll see that you have a number of different tabs. You'll see that a snippets item has been made available within the snippets tab. So what you can do is just double click on that. A nice shortcut to execute a query is done by pressing Control Enter. Sure enough, those results appear. I can modify my query. And again, I realize I'm jumping ahead of things because in the next section, we'll talk about creating, retrieving, updating, and deleting data queries. So what that query syntax entails. But nonetheless, this should be easy enough to understand. We are going to select the first name and only the first name from the actor table. So what I can do is, again, hit Control Enter. And we're greeted with all of the first names found in that table. Again, I can go over to the snippets list saver and select first names from actor table, press OK, close those queries, and you'll see we have the second snippet has been added. So very easy way to build up a list of very useful queries. You can also create a table within the SQL development workspace. So if I just go ahead and return to the overview tab, I can click the add table option. Continuing with the DVD store theme, suppose you wanted to start tracking all of the directors associated with a film. I can go ahead and create the table name. We'll use the singular form of director in order to keep with the conventions already embraced by the Sequila database. And if you look down at the bottom of this pop-up window, you'll see a variety of different options, many of which I haven't introduced you to yet, but will do so later in the video. However, this one should be quite familiar, the columns feature. And of course, columns relates to the columns found in the table. This will be, of course, our primary key for the director table, which I'll call ID. Integer makes sense. It's a primary key, not null, unsigned and automatically incrementing. Let's just add one more column to this. So the director's name, you can tab over to the data type. As you can see, the default is Vercare with 45 character limit. So I'm going to change that to 255. And again, we wouldn't want it to be null. So I'll enable that checkbox. And when you're ready to create that table, you can go ahead and press apply. And what's interesting, I think, particularly for learning purposes, is that MySQL Workbench will show you the SQL query that is about to be executed. So we're, of course, creating a new table. You should by now be very familiar with this, as we've gone over it repeatedly in previous sections. Create table. This is just a different way to specify that we want it to go to the Sequila database. The table is called director, ID, name, primary key is ID. We'll press apply. And if we press finish and then close, you'll see that the director table has been added to the Sequila database. Once created, you want to perhaps add a few new rows to the director table. So you can right click the director table icon, click edit table data. So what you'll want to do next is go ahead and just enter the name of a director. And you can go ahead and press enter. At that point, you can also kind of stretch out the column in order to see the entire value. Then what you're going to want to do is press the Apply Changes to Data icon. And you'll know you need to press this because the little star appears when the data hasn't yet been saved. So I'll go ahead and press that. Again, you're greeted with the query used to insert this new row. I'll press Apply and then Finish the Overview tab and select all rows you'll see the newly added row in the output. You also have the option of editing a previously entered value. So I'll return to the director table, edit table data. I actually don't know what Steven Spielberg's middle initial is, but let's pretend it's T. You can make that change. Again, 
apply those changes, and you'll see now an update statement. Update director, set name equal to Steven T. Spielberg, where ID equals one. I'll press apply, finish, and those changes have been made. Finally, of course, you can delete tables rather easily. So let's just go ahead and remove this director table since we were just using it for demonstration purposes. I've right clicked on the table. I'll drop table, apply, finish, and we're done. So a very useful way to query data to manipulate different parts of the table schema. I've only showed you just a small part of the SQL development workspace capabilities, but we'll certainly return to some of the other more advanced features later in the video. So next up, let's take a look at what I think is the most interesting of the three workspaces, which is the data modeling workspace. Next up is the data modeling workspace. So as I mentioned in the introduction, MySQL Workbench's data modeling capabilities allow you to create and manage database models in a highly visual way. Though I think this definition actually kind of sells this particular feature a bit short because it's actually capable of much more than that. For instance, suppose you were working on a new project which required a database. Using the data modeling tool, we can create what's known as an EER model or enhanced entity relationship model, which will embody all of the features of the new database, including its relationships, again, in a highly visual way, as you'll soon see. You can then synchronize this model with your MySQL server. Therefore, you can import this visual diagram into the database and create the desired database schema that is embodied by that model. Furthermore, should changes to that data schema occur outside of MySQL Workbench and, of course, work their way into the schema as found in the MySQL database server, you can then synchronize those changes back to your MySQL Workbench data model. So it's a very convenient way to build and maintain your database schemas over time. It's definitely worth taking a few minutes to kind of explore the features at your disposal. So to get started, let's go ahead and create a new EER model by clicking the icon shown at the bottom. And just as was the case with the previous workspace, a new tab will be created. Now, MySQL Workbench has this funny default behavior of calling every newly created model uh, MyDB, which doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly because I think you're going to want to match the model name with that of the actual database. So you can change this by right-clicking on the name and choosing Edit Schema. And in the Name field, which appears, you can go ahead and change that to whatever you please. So. Let's assume we are creating a new database for development purposes on our local computer, so I'll call it dev underscore example. Now, once you mouse out of the name field, you'll be prompted to confirm that you want to rename all schema occurrences associated with this name, so go ahead and say yes. If you close that tab, you'll see that we have the new name associated with the model, at which point you can begin adding tables. So let's just go ahead and add a new table, which we'll call customers, and then go ahead and we'll just add two columns to the customers table. Starting with the primary key per usual, I'll remove that odd naming convention that MySQL Workbench likes to use, just calling our primary key ID. It's an integer, it's a primary key, not null, unsigned, and finally, AI for auto increment. We'll just add one more column called name. The default Veracare type pops up. We'll just change the maximum size to 255. And again, also make this column not null. Go ahead and just press the X to close that tab. You'll see that our new customers table has been created. Go ahead and edit that table at any later point, if you please. Changing the name, adding columns, changing column names. So you certainly could continue adding tables in this manner. However, I'd also like to demonstrate another even more visual way to go about adding and maintaining 
your table schema information. And that's done by way of a diagram. So go ahead and double click on the diagram icon, and you'll see that this grid appears alongside the name of our new model, dev underscore example, with the tables associated with that model. Now what you can do is you can drag any existing tables out onto the grid, offering an even more visual way to kind of conceptualize what this schema is ultimately going to look like. Now what else you can do is you can actually create new tables within this grid-based structure. And you can do that by clicking this icon, which will in turn change your mouse cursor. And we'll just find an empty space on the grid, press down on the mouse, and then double click the newly created table to perhaps most notably change its name. We'll call it States. So this is going to contain a list of United States states. We will create the primary key of ID. We'll change this to tiny int. You can type in your data types or you can find them on the list. There we go, tiny int. Primary key, not null, unsigned, and finally auto increment. And we'll just add one more column. Again, we'll call it name. And although I think 45 would work, we'll just change that to 255. And we'll also make this not null. Right? We'll close the tab. And now we have a second table added to our data model. Now, what's really interesting is we can bind foreign keys relationships as we had done in previous sections by way of the MySQL command line client. We can create these relations visually using this EER diagram interface. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and double click on customers. We're going to add one more column. We're going to call it state ID. And that's going to be a tiny int. And just like the state's ID column, we want it to be not null and unsigned. Once that's done, you can click the foreign keys tab. We can call this whatever we please, but we'll just use state ID to keep things nice and straightforward. Once I tab over, it's going to ask you what the referenced table is, so where that associated key is in the foreign table. That's in the states table, so we'll select that. And then the column associated with that foreign key is the state ID, and it references the ID column found in the referenced table. We can set our options. So on update, we want that to cascade. Same thing for delete if we so choose to do so. And that's it. And you'll notice now that the relationship is made apparent visually which binds these two tables together. In fact, you can even highlight the relationship line and it will highlight the foreign key and the primary key found in the two tables. So very, very easy way to build and maintain your table schemas. But what I'd like to show you next is another very, very cool feature, which allows you to, again, push these changes to your MySQL server. So we'll go ahead and save these changes to a workbench model file, which you'll see is identified here, save as type. I'll just save this on the desktop. We'll call it dev underscore example. And I'll save this file. Next up, we can go to the database tab found at the top and forward engineer this model as we're going to push it into the MySQL database. You have a number of different options at your disposal. Press next. We want to export the MySQL table objects. Next, it's going to show us the SQL query commands, which are going to create these tables and relationships. And if we scroll down, you'll even see the foreign key constraint for state ID is added to customers, as we would expect. I'll press Next again. We have a stored connection. We want to push this into localhost. And finally, we will execute those changes. It tells us it's been done successfully. Now, if I go ahead and press Close, then work through all of my tabs and I will enter my password. Now if I run show databases, you will see that the dev underscore example database is now available. Now we'll use dev underscore example, finally show tables, and you'll see that the two tables have in fact been added. So very straightforward, very user friendly way to go about creating your tables and manage them over time.
So next up, let's take a look at the third workspace, which allows you to administrate various aspects of your MySQL server. The third and final workspace is the server administration workspace. You can use this workspace to configure your database server, manage user accounts, and pretty much carry out anything related more to the administrative aspects of the MySQL server itself than the administrative aspects of some database, for instance. So the first time you use this workspace, you're going to want to create a new server instance. Essentially what you're doing is you're registering a new server instance to manage. You might, over the course of time, manage three or four MySQL servers. So what this will do is allow you to configure a list of those servers and then easily click and enter one of those server instances for management purposes. So the first time you do that, you're going to click the New Server Instance option. You'll be greeted with a number of options here. You can use localhost. You can identify a remote server or you can use an existing database connection configuration, which we created previously. So I'll go ahead and just do that now. Press Next. It's going to test the database connection for you. Successful. We'll press Next. Next up, it's asking us to choose the service from the list below. And in my case, on this Windows machine, it is the MySQL 5.5 service. I've named it that because it's MySQL 5.5, which is currently running on my machine. I'll press Next. It's tested the host machine settings. I'll press next again. Press continue to finalize this. Server instance name, you can name this anything you please. I'll call it localhost and press finish. And that new server instance will be added to your list. Once created, go ahead and double click on that instance. And again, as with the other workspaces, a new tab will be created. What you see here is just a general overview of this MySQL server. It offers an easy way to look at your CPU usage, your memory usage, the number of connections currently being made in conjunction with the server, traffic. You can also see which connections are being made. You can start up and stop your MySQL server from this screen. A wide variety of configuration variables. You can manage what's called the options file. This is something we'll talk about later. You can manage your users and privileges. And finally, you can import and export data. The third and final graphical client I'd like to introduce in this section is SQL YOG. SQL YOG is a MySQL administration tool with more than a decade of active development under its belt during which time the product has really evolved into a highly optimized and feature-packed desktop application. Now, at the time of this recording, SQL YOG was currently only officially supported on Windows, so unfortunately, OS X and Linux users are out of luck with this particular product. However, if you are a Windows user, I certainly think it would be well worth your time to download the trial product and have a look around. Now, perhaps just to quickly clarify regarding mention of the trial product, SQL YOG is primarily available and known for its commercial version. However, there is also a free version, which you can download over at the Google Code Project Repository website. I think, really, its real value does lie in its commercial version, precisely because there are so many additional features packed into the commercial product. Now, fortunately, the license is available for as cheaply as $99. I think that version comes without technical support. However, there are a variety of slightly more expensive licenses also available for different licensing circumstances, and you can find all of the latest information about that over on the SQL YOG website. One example which I think really drives home the power of SQL YOG's streamlined interface is the database creation process. So as you can see over here, in the left pane, we have a list of existing databases. So if we want to go ahead and create a new database, just right click in that area and select Create Database. I'll go ahead and create a database called Library, a database that would be used to track perhaps books that are made available through a public lending system. I'll go ahead and press Create. And as you can see within this left pane, a new database has been created under it a number of different folders associated with different important database related features. So with the database created, 
we can start the table creation process. There are a number of different ways you can create tables from within SQL YOG. However, my preferred method involves using the schema designer, which you can access via the icon located at the top right of the application toolbar. So I'll go ahead and press that. And a new tab opens called schema designer. Quite convenient. You can switch back and forth between tabs as necessary. So what I'll do next is create our first table in the library database, one called books, which would logically be used to hold the books found in the library catalog. So create table, and we'll go through the by now quite familiar table creation process. It's our primary key. It's not null. We want it to be unsigned, and we want it to be an auto-incrementing primary key. What's nice is you can just hit the tab key to continue cycling across each cell and row. So we've added the ID column. Next up, let's go ahead and add the title column. It's a Vericare 255, not null. Next up, let's just add one more column for demonstration purposes. This will be a foreign key column, which we'll associate with a table we'll create in just a moment. We'll make this a tiny int and not null, unsigned. So once you've gone ahead and added all of the necessary rows, you can press the Create Table button. And we'll call this Table Books. Press OK. SQL YOG tells us the table has been created and prompts us to create more tables. I'll say yes because we want to create a Categories table. And again, ID. This is a tiny int. Primary key. It's unsigned and it's auto increment. And we just want to include the category title, of course. I'll press Create Table. Categories will be the name. I'll press OK. And this time we'll press No. We're done with the table creation process. So as you can see, the schema designer has added two table grids to the canvas. So next thing we want to do is we want to associate the relation between the books table and the categories table by way of the category ID foreign key. So I'll go ahead and right click on that column, choose the relationships slash foreign keys option. We want to create a new relationship, so I'll press the new button. Our current table, that is the table containing the foreign key, is books, and it references categories. The ID column, which is the primary key in the categories table, is associated with the category ID column found in the books table. Let's add a couple constraints for on delete and on update. We'll restrict those and press create. Once done, the SQL YOG confirms that we have created this particular reference. And I'll close the wizard. And as you can see, we now have this relationship between connecting the two tables, which is each category. So there's a one to many relationship. Each category can be associated with many books. What's nice about SQL YOG is that these changes are taking place in real time. So as you create a foreign key relationship or as you create a new table, these changes are actually being pushed right over to the MySQL database that you've connected to. So there's no need to synchronize your changes or anything like that. If you want to save the schema layout, if you want to save the positioning of your tables and the way you have everything set up within the schema designer, you do need to go ahead and save that to your file system, which you can do by just clicking the X and you'll be prompted to save the schema design. Schema XML, which you can then go ahead and choose the location within your file system where you'd like to save the file. So very useful, very convenient. I mean, in just a couple clicks and just a little bit of typing, we've created the new library database and then created a couple tables and even created an association. SQL YOG's interface is equally streamlined when it comes to the task of navigating and modifying existing database data. I'll just go ahead and close this out. I'll just say no. If I head over to the left pane to the Sequila database and open the tables folder, you'll see that we have all of the by now usual set of tables found within the Sequila database. If you right click, on the table name, you'll see that you have a variety of different options. I'll just go ahead and open the table, which in doing so adds all of the table data to the not surprisingly named table data tab. 
at which point you can see that it's showing 25 rows at a time. We can quickly cycle through or page through each set of rows, which is quite convenient. I've just returned to the beginning. You can also use this form interface. So you can page one record at a time through the database. If I return to the grid, you'll see that it is also quite easy to make a table change. So I've gone ahead and changed Ed's name to Chevy. You'll see down in the lower right corner that we're told that the data has been modified but not saved. It will be saved once we press the Save Changes button. So I'll go ahead and do so now, and you'll see that that notification disappears. It's also possible to construct freeform SQL queries using a highly optimized interface. For instance, suppose you wanted to retrieve a list of just the actor's first and last names. So we can go ahead and head over to the Query tab and start typing our query out. What you can do to save some typing is press Control and Space after you start typing, for instance, a column name, and you'll be greeted with this drop down list which pulls up a list of all matching options. So we'll start typing last, control space, I'll just go down to last name, from actor. Once your query has been assembled, you can press F9 to execute that query. And as you can see, it is really, really fast. The result set contains the list of all logically first and last names associated with that query. From here, you can copy the results to the clipboard if you'd like. Copy all rows, copy cell data. You can select specific rows and copy just those using the third option. You can also export that data using a variety of formats, CSV, HTML, and those are all quite useful. There are all kinds of really useful features which you often just randomly encounter when working with SQL Yog. So for instance, I often need to send a particular query to a colleague some of which can be rather long and complex. So what you can do is you can use the SQL formatter to make a query that you might have typed out in haste. You can make it look quite cleaned up and formatted in a very easy to understand way. You can do that by right clicking within the query area and choosing SQL formatter and then format current query. And as you can see, upon doing so, SQL YOG will organize your query in a really easy to understand way. The third and final of, frankly, many possible candidate features that I'd like to introduce in this section is SQL YOG's scheduled backup feature. It's often the case you're working on a project and it's necessary to take snapshots of your database on a regular basis. So you could easily roll back to an earlier point in time should a number of changes or should a particular update not go the way you expected it to during the development process. Or for that matter, logically, you're going to want to be creating database backups on a regular basis. In either case, if you are using SQL YOG, you can use its highly convenient scheduled backups feature. And so, for instance, suppose we wanted to backup the Sequila actor table on a daily basis. You can do that by heading over to Power Tools, choosing the Scheduled Backups option. And in doing so, you'll be greeted with the introductory section of the Scheduled Backup Wizard. So what we want to do is we want to start a new Scheduled Backup. We'll select the default here, Start a New Job. And I'll press Next. Here we are asked to confirm various database connection details. I'll just leave them set to the defaults. Go ahead and press Next. Now, you have the option here of backing up absolutely everything, which in a typical scenario you'll do, but for the sake of demonstration, we'll go ahead and back up just the actor table. I'll press Next. Next, we are asked in what format we want to back up the database tables. And we want to compress them to save some space. We're going to use a single file. What this is going to do is going to put all of the backed up objects within a single file. Because we're only backing up the actors table, we'll just call it actors. And we also, I think this is pretty convenient, we want to prefix the archive name with the timestamp so it would be easy to visually identify which backup goes with which date. So I've gone ahead and selected that, press next. 
Here we are asked to confirm a variety of backup related options, such as whether we want to include create database statements, use database statements, and so on. I'll just leave these set to the defaults. Press next. Again, we are greeted with a number of this time somewhat more advanced backup options, such as how we want to handle foreign keys and a variety of other slightly more advanced features. I'll press next again. This is an interesting feature. You can be emailed a notification each time the backup wizard completes the backup or only in the case of an error, because you certainly don't want to not be kept informed of the backup status on a regular basis and then find out three months down the road that there's been an error every time the wizard attempted to do the backup. So you certainly want to keep on top of the weekly or daily status of your backups. Go ahead and press next. Next, we want to save and schedule this, and this being a Windows-specific program, it's going to use the Windows Scheduler to do that. So you'll check Saving Options, and we want to save and schedule it using the Windows Scheduler. I'll press Next. And this is the configuration file SQL Yog will generate, and it just wants you to identify the name of that file, and I'll call it Actor Backups. Schedule name, we'll call it the same thing. Actor backups again, and I'll press finish. Once I press OK following that confirmation dialog, the Windows scheduling wizard will be brought up. And what you can do here is click on the schedule tab and create a schedule for this particular task. And the default, as you can see here, is at 9 a.m. every day starting today. We want it to happen daily, but you can also choose weekly, monthly, and so on. You can change the time. You can even schedule an interval every one day, every two days, and so on. So we'll just go ahead and press OK. Here you are asked to confirm your system password as opposed to your MySQL password because we're dealing with the Windows scheduler now. And once you press OK, everything disappears and that task has been created. So a very convenient way to deal with backups on a schedule which really conforms to any particular business requirement, whether it's daily, twice daily, weekly, or what have you. And it is all easily done via SQL Yog's very convenient point and click interface. So maybe to summarize this section, I introduced three tools, PHP My Admin, MySQL Workbench, and now SQL Yog. These are all great tools your task now is to figure out which tool is most suitable to your particular workflow or your particular needs. But I think you would be selling yourself short to not spend some time with each one. Only in doing so are you going to be able to make that proper determination.